um hi books uh, we have divij and myself paul um in today's session this event is peer headed by dust an ngo from goa uh, earlier they used to do these programs called monday fix goa offline to encourage critical thinking and boost social capital these online programs are their new avatar uh, this is made possible by has uh thus looks uh for donations to these programs and uh link to donate is in the start uh and has geeks uh page for this event so uh hopefully uh you will find all the links in place uh we are streaming on zoom and on youtube uh devyani is also uh live tweeting from the hasgeek twitter handle uh housekeeping rules uh q and a uh, session will happen after the which uh kind of wraps up his presentation uh please uh try and uh post the questions uh for people on zoom uh please post it in the q and a section on zoom uh i will be uh handling both the q and a section in zoom and on the youtube comments um with that uh, i'm going to hand it over to devish to introduce himself and uh kind of kick start the presentation okay thanks paul um so my name is devish joshi uh i am a lawyer and a mozilla tech policy fellow um my role basically is to look into you know or what i'm trying to do is to build more just and equitable technology policy in india um so i study issues around internet governance around privacy um and data regulation uh and i'm really particularly interested in kind of uh you know unpacking platforms and free speech um which i think is something a, a conversation that's incredibly important and uh, one that's been lacking in you know not been critically interrogated in india um to a great extent so i'm very excited and thanks to hasgeek uh, for you know calling me here thanks to paul for moderating this i'll be keeping my presentation fairly short and kind of crisp hopefully um and then uh you know i'd love to have a kind of conversation with everybody who's watching uh respond to your questions and maybe you know learn some things from you as well um so i'll just start off with a few stories right um about why this is important and we we're talking about platforms and we're talking about uh you know privatized content moderation today so i'll unpack what platforms are what content moderation is and why it affects us particularly you know sitting here in india what the government is likely to do um and what social media companies be, and or like platforms are doing so story number 1 um in 2019 twitter suspended the account of a kashmiri media publication kashmiri reporter and the journalist that was associated with that um for uh, talking about burhan wani um this was in response to a government take down request it's unclear what the legal root of that request was um this is one example of the extent to which um uh you know uh, kashmiri voices have been systematically stifled on in in a, um on online forums and on on through social media um and twitter's own transparency report which again is not the most transparent report indicates that close to a million tweets have been asked to be taken down by the indian government alone um which accounts for you know all the other government requests for take downs put together twitter uh, as again as per transparency reports has mostly complied with these requests so problem number 1 is of this unholy nexus between government censorship and social media censorship problem number 2 um of hate speech and harassment and unsafe online spaces um in 2019 again um a lot of you might have participated in this event where and myself included everybody got really sick and tired of twitter um and the fact that it refused to do anything about massive amounts of caste discrimination online massive amounts of um, islamophobia and sexual violence um against women and and minorities um at some point a movement developed to you know mass migrate to vote with your feet and show twitter that you know if you continue to do this we're going to leave a lot of people ended up going to this new decentralized social media um network of sorts called mastodon um 
that movement didn't last long and hopefully we we'll, we can discuss what the problem with that kind of voting with your feet is or or you know what it didn't solve um screenshotted here is also twitter's response to this entire movement saying that you know don't look at us we are a political um, which is a classic response to, to deny that any of their actions are actually political actions any of them have um you know i- intrinsic biases or or, or um are reflective of certain kinds of logics uh, within which twitter and social media is embedded and uh, problem number 3 uh, something again very close to my heart and i forgot to mention um in addition to being a uh, mozilla tech policy fellow i also help uh, i also write for and contribute to um the spicy ip blog uh where i primarily lo- look at issues of copyright and again internet governance and um, intermediary liability so um and this is something that keeps happening again and again um youtube has a system called content id which is an automated filtration system um through that system it basically fingerprints certain kinds of musical or um you know videographic works um and if it matches a fingerprint which has been submitted by a copyright holder then it automatically takes it down or monetizes it in favor of the person who submitted it initially um what happened in this case was that a js bach symphony uh, uh symphony was Uh, wrongly marked as a copyrighted content for Sony BMG, um, and then was taken down. Now, this was a symphony that was being used by a German professor to teach classical music, and I think it's fairly obvious that something that was about two or three hundred years ago is very much out of copyright and very much available to for anyone to use. Um, th- these stories abound, right? I mean, uh, from personal experience, a few days ago, I tried to put up a video of my cat. dancing to a black eyed peas song in the background it was a 10 second video um meant you know only for a private instagram account uh about 5 minutes later i got a mail saying that it's been taken down again a case of automated filtration um in something which should otherwise be very clearly you know allowed under the law it would be considered fair use of um that 10 second song clip but anyway it got taken down um so i've just linked you and i'll i'll be sharing these slides later there's many more stories about how content moderation goes wrong like this and who it harms um and why it's not something that's you know why it's something that we all need to worry about um a, a couple of particularly good efforts here um the mozilla foundation has done some work on uh, you know some storytelling about how content moderation harms us um and equality labs has done a very interesting a very good and deep dive into facebook's hate speech problem in india where they've highlighted uh, caste discrimination and islamophobia so what we're talking about today um is referred to you know or rather i think of it as um it's called a wicked problem right um a wicked problem is something that's often used in policy discourse as something that's a, a problem that's difficult or impossible to solve um because of you know because it keeps changing the the requirements to actually solve the problem keeps changing and i think um the takeaway for this is not to say that you know we have a clear um solution to online harms or a, a clear solution to why content moderation goes wrong um but perhaps to indicate that this is a space that is vital to you know our democratic participation or the public sphere um and it's and, and it's important to recognize the kind of politics um which inhabits this space right it's important to recognize the rules um through which all of the decisions about our speech or about our gov- uh, our online behaviors are made um and we need to you know recognize that uh, platforms and the, these different institutions and rules exhibit certain forms of power and we should also figure out for ourselves how we can respond to this and how we can make you know um how we can make our online lives more equitable how we can make them more democratic and participatory so that's the point um of this presentation so we tend to think of platforms as um intermediaries right the term itself kind of embodies this neutral third party which is only connecting two individuals or two kind of uh, communities together with no real role to play in between um and that's somewhat a deliberate way in which this term has been employed and used by major um online companies um to make it seem that you know um it's just two people speaking to each other there's nothing in between um it's facebook is just a way to com- connect the world right um now this is blatantly false um all platforms govern speech in fact content moderation is at the heart of what any platform does right um without it its business its 
rationale or reason for existence would not uh, it, it would not exist so the question therefore isn't you know um whether platforms are governing speech but rather how platforms are governing speech and whether and how we can unpack it and respond to it um so what we need to unpack is you know how do platforms decide the rules and principles and standards which govern our speech today how do platforms start applying these rules and how do they pass the various contexts you know the innumerable contexts and jurisdictions in which um uh, these rules are meant to be applied and primarily how do they do this at scale because i think the biggest problem or one of the biggest problems with platforms and the kind of um activity that goes on through online platforms is one of scale um and just to give you a quote from um a, a twitter executive again is um right at the top over there that given the scale that twitter works at a one in a million chance happens 500 times a day um also to say that um you know even if twitter successfully manages to say catch 0.01 um you know even if say 0.1% of all speech on uh, twitter is hate speech that still leaves up to you know um 100000 or 150000 tweets that are abusive and harmful now if you need to apply uh, a judicial logic to each of these cases to uh, you know for a court to determine whether or not um this constitutes illegal or harmful speech um you start noticing why this problem of scale becomes particularly pernicious or and difficult so yeah so i think what we need to do therefore to look into it is to um see what are the politics that platforms embody within these practices of content moderation um so what do platforms do first of all um first to answer that question um i know the topic says privatized censorship but i think censorship kind of embodies a um you know is is a larger um term to be used here it's it's not simply the take down of content but also how platforms structure content and govern all govern content in its entire life cycle right so it's about not just about what content is taken down but what content is filtered in that who is allowed to see what forms of content um when i log on to my facebook or my twitter i you know first of all i don't necessarily see things in a chronological order um i don't necessarily see things that other people would want me to see so uh, you know twitter might determine that this x tweet is of uh, more importance to me um or is more relevant to me uh, because that's the kind of test that they employ and therefore they filter that content to the top of my feed as at, at the same time a lot of the other content which they think that i may not be interested in will be filtered down right so it's like a ranking system um and similarly you know what kind of speeches they allow and what kind of speeches they recommend so um when it's a question of hate speech or uh you know defamatory speech is also a question of um the more the question about moderation gets flipped it's about you know what kind of speech is your guidelines or are your institutional logics permitting um and this is an important question because when you look at how platforms operate a lot of it is about uh you know improving engagement or connecting the world as facebook would want it um and in that engagement you know in in that metric of popularity um a lot of um voices that you know are not popular tend to get left out which is why the question of what is allowed explicitly also needs to be brought out and similarly you know what is recommended um when for example youtube creates um an automatic playlist for me uh based on one or two videos what i see how how are they doing that and how are they moderating what i should see next or what is the general kind of um sphere of content that that i'm living in right um why do companies moderate uh is the second question and i think there are a number of reasons for this the primarily primary reason being that if companies did not moderate then we would be you know drowning in a sea of digital noise we wouldn't be able to make sense of anything that's being said um but to you know go a step further it's often because of you know their commercial logics in responding to um what their users want and responding to user research a lot of it is about creating safer communities um you know upholding the principles that say again twitter and facebook wanted to help with the arab spring movement and create more democratic movements um or just create safer communities um or more fun communities like say a reddit or a vimeo would um and finally they also do it within specific legal um context legal and social context so often they do it responding to laws often they do it responding to social obligations um increasingly the latter because we don't really have a legal regime to deal with this as i'll indicate later 
Um, and finally, how do they do it? Right? What are the um, kind of what are the institutional and technical mechanisms by which platforms exhibit their politics? So yeah, like I mentioned, um, you know, there are both institutional logics, uh, technological logics, and legal logics behind how platforms moderate content. Um, often these are, you know, these are not clear, and and I don't think there's any kind of uniformity or uh, much clarity in how this is going on. Um, all of these logics are messy, they're contested, and they're not uniform. Right. So, but the first thing that we can kind of think about is how are these rules which platforms are applying? How do they come up with them? And I think um, you know there have been some very interesting case studies, mostly in the U.S. about um, the rulemaking procedures and the business practices or business policies. Um, and there's some interesting examples that I've just pointed out here. So Facebook's guidelines, um, you know, each of these um, major social media platforms, your uh, Reddit's and your Facebooks, um, even something like Wiki Wikipedia, have community guidelines, right? Those guidelines kind of reflect what kind of community each of those platforms want to build. Um, they're often incorporated within or distinct from uh, their terms of use, which are uh, necessary contractual terms which all users are expected to comply with. So these, all of these rules um, are not necessarily the ones that are applied because as I mentioned, it's often messy and contested and non-transparent. So we don't know exactly how they're applying these. Um, but these rules are, you know, made up within boardrooms. They're made up within, uh, you know, by the uh, public policy advisors to all of these uh, social media companies. Um, and um, the rules are made, you know, they're made within, again, that, that specific institutional or social context. So to give you an example from Facebook community guidelines, um, not, not the community guidelines, sorry, but the kind of, um, the kind of guidance that they give content moderators, uh, they have a simple kind of rule of saying that, you know, um, if it's a protected category and if you're attacking that protected category, then the speech is unlawful as per Facebook. So if you say, you know, white men suck, um, and this is an example that they use in, in the slide, no offense to anybody at all, of course. Um, but if you say white men suck, that's protected speech and it will be taken off um, Facebook. But if you say black children suck, um, that's for some reason an unprotected category. The reason being that although main uh, certain kinds of demographic categories are protected, subcategories within those categories are not protected. So white and man are protected, um, but children is not a protected category. So you can you know attack black children or black drivers or female drivers. Um, so it, it's a fairly strange metric to use. But basically, that's kind of that. That's the guidance that then goes out to um, the thousands of content moderation moderators, as well as the algorithms that Facebook is employing to take down content. Um, another thing that, of course, platforms uh, platform regulation is based on is uh, both legal and kind of extra legal government pressure. Um, and referring back to the unholy nexus of government censorship and platform censorship. Um, Again, an, an instance from Facebook's hidden uh, content moderation guidelines. These are not the public facing ones, but the ones that Facebook itself internally comes up with and uses. Uh, where Facebook suddenly decided that calls for an independent Kashmir are against Indian law, uh, which is, well, kind of blatantly untrue. You can, you, you know, holding up a free Kashmir sign is not sedition, nor is it against Indian law. Um, but as per Facebook's content moderators, as well as as per their algorithms, when this kind of um, when these rules get embedded within automated mechanisms, uh, all of this will be filtered as unlawful speech. Um, now, again, um, there are different ways. This is not to say that you know the Facebook guidelines are um, or this kind of massive form of um, or massive top-down approach of. Uh, content moderation is the only one. There are different models depending on the platform which you approach and depending on what you what kind of output you um, want. There are different models of how platform uh, moderation works. So uh, one of some of these which are mostly exhibited in smaller platforms like say a Vimeo or an upcoming platform are bespoke, uh, where there's a lot of editorial control over what you get to see. There's explicit editorial endorsement of certain kinds of content. Um, another one is more decentralized approach um, where you know Wikipedia is a great example of this where 
certain kinds certain people um within the community um are held up as responsible for applying the rules of a platform these don't necessarily need to be employees of um employees um or executives of the company itself but it's kind of more community oriented so even reddit to a large degree reddit forums are also community based content moderation um or or ra- rather rely very heavily on community based content moderation and finally you have these large scale industrial approaches of the kind that i've been referring to mostly and the ones that, in fact that possibly pose the gravest challenges to us right so facebook and twitter kind of employ these um you know massively centralized uh, somewhat vague and somewhat um you know ununiformly applied uh broad guidelines and and, and rules um another thing that's really important to point out and something that often goes missing in this conversation is that uh content moderation is a gigantic and continuous business right given maybe close to 3 billion or 4 billion people are now online and using social media imagine the kind of effort that goes into um you know regulating speech at that scale um and behind that is it's not simply technologies it's not simply executives but there's a very human um you know labor that undertakes the the content moderation in fact in bangalore itself there are like these huge offices of people sitting in front of screens having to look at really really terrible content um day in and day out and clicking whether this is accepted or not um and there's some wonderful kind of work that's been done around this as well as some um you know great movies and other uh, other cultural things that have been made right um so yes there's um a lot of human content moderation that goes on um but increasingly given the sophistication of uh you know machine learning tools or ai or um you know general kind of algorithmic tools um they are increasingly being um employed to deal with this problem of scale right the, to deal with this problem of like there are 1 billion things to govern how do we do it so uh, some examples of this some one that i already spoke about are content id and fingerprinting techniques uh, fin- and you know these are the most kind of popular techniques uh, so far that have been employed um and fingerprinting um and what's kind of sometimes called hashing although it's not cryptographic hashing exactly um is a technique where a certain kind of content um you know gets fingerprinted and gets uploaded to a database um for purposes of matching it with any kind of subsequent content so um like i said if you have submitted um a copyrighted work to youtube it will hash that content upload it to its content id system and if there's any subsequent content which matches the content that's already in its system it will detect it and block it right uh, similarly uh, microsoft has a photo dna database um a d- database that was mostly created for um child sexual abuse imagery which is one of the biggest problems on the internet and has always been um and uh, you know a grave problem to be um dealt with um when the indian government found out that such a system exists it then asked you know um i think it was the cbi or the ib one of them um was you know saw that this is wow this is a great way to basically find anything that we want to so they started asking facebook to photo dna every photo um you know and every photo within their um systems uh, so that the ib can, and and the cbi can better investigate it um fingerprinting is also being used in uh, more voluntary forms or more voluntary initiatives uh, like i said there's already um quite a large effort a global effort including online platforms um to kind of tackle se- child sexual abuse imagery very important effort similarly there's been um this global internet forum to counter terrorism which also has a bunch of um online platforms which work together with governments um and they use a similar technique where uh, it's not very clear how um how certain content gets flagged or how it gets submitted but they use similar fingerprinting techniques to catch uh, what could potentially be unlawful content um and i'll briefly talk about why this particularly is very pernicious right why, why robo censorship while it seems like a problem to the uh, while it seems like a solution to the problem of scale um why it's incredibly problematic is because um while human moderators often kind of um you know you can grasp the context of particular kinds of speech um when you're simply creating automated systems or even machine learning systems machines cannot grasp any kind of con- uh, context and all speech governance is heavily context dependent right 
if you're it could be anything i mean if you're um say standing in the middle of a field and you shout fire it may not be illegal but if you're doing it in a cinema it may be illegal um another example from facebook again was um when facebook decided to take down um a fo- uh, this very iconic photo from the vietnam war um of a young girl running away from uh, the us army's napalm bombing um saying that this b- because the young girl was uh, you know without clothes they said that this is child sexual abuse imagery um but in fact it was you know um it was content that was meant to critique kind of us imperialism or the vietnam war um a lot of these problems get made particularly in in copyright because um within copyright law the kind of you know when cultural creations are shared um there's a lot of context dependence um on how it's shared and whether that sharing is allowed by the law right so we have terms like fair use and fair dealing under copyright law which allow large amounts of cultural content or copyrighted content to be um shared by people which is heavily context dependent so if you're using it in the con- in the course of teaching for example it may be allowed but if you're simply using it to party um you know to just like play a song out loud for your neighborhood it would obviously not be allowed unfortunately an algorithm or a machine cannot determine this and and, and doesn't know how this happens so the other problems of course from this are that um you know we are no longer living in uh simply the era where you know um the era of like the tv propaganda i think um more and more our online deli- uh, our online deliberations shape our society as they shape our politics um we've already seen instances like cambridge analytica kind of the you know the whole tool of um you know the gamut of political persuasion being used to affect our um political choices as well as our social choices so the increase in hate speech um you know online that can almost directly be tracked to like the increase in rising uh, rises of inst- um you know violence against minorities so essentially um the kind of rules that these platforms make then very directly affect our society very directly affect us as individuals um but there are no th- there's been no effort to think about this um in terms of how to democratically participate in it or how to democratically regulate um these kind of platforms right um this the choices that we make about speech about our communities and uh, you know uh, what we condemn or what we condone um are often choices that are made through constitutions and through written laws right um and then which are then adjudicated in a case by case basis by judges so that they can again um you know be open be transparent be accountable and so that everybody can democratically agree on a shared set of rules by which we all seek to abide um unfortunately platforms don't you know have pushed themselves out as these private entities and as private entities they don't technically have any um constitutional requirement to uh, abide by democratic participation or abide by constitutional rules um so they can censor freely and they do censor freely um they can promote content that they want freely and it's very difficult to you know in the absence or in the legal void it's very difficult to ask platforms to um behave in a specific manner with with respect to any kind of content and we see that this is not um you know as the specific problems of kind of network speech or massively network speech increase we're seeing that we're asking more and more of platforms um and we're delegating more and more responsibility over the public sphere and over crucial decisions about what speech should be allowed in the public to these platforms and to their inherently opaque and non-transparent and unaccountable practices so you know the problems of fake news or kind of like how you know what is truthful and what is not truthful that's been given over to um platforms problems of privacy about um, how much privacy can i reasonably expect online um you know the landmark case in this is the google um google versus costeha case um in the eu uh where basically uh, the highest court of the uh, european union delegated the decision about the right to be forgotten to google they essentially said that you know if somebody comes up to you with an ask to be deindexed from google you need to deliberate on whether they uh, whether public interest is more important or whether their privacy is more important um and instead of a court giving you that direction it's now someone within google making up these rules um so essentially like i said um you know because this is now emerging as the most important avenue or the the most important kind of uh, 
way for public sphere for the public sphere to emerge or for democratic decisions and uh, consequential decisions to emerge. Um, these are questions that should ideally be undertaken by courts and parliaments and not by boardroom executives. However, oops, yeah. Um, in India, we really haven't done much to deal with this problem. We really haven't done much to kind of talk about democratic control over online speech. Um, and this kind of stems from, and I'll give a brief history of how platform speech is regulated in India um, to basically conclude that it's not. Um, and it starts with the concept of intermediary liability and it actually goes back to a very old decision. Um, some of you may be aware of Avnish Bajaj, the director um, or the owner of Bazi.com. Uh, Bazi the, um, and now Bazi.com has started selling pornographic material online, um, which was declared to be obscene material by the courts. And this was prior to the enactment of the, um, the new IT Act. Um, and in that time, uh, because, you know, because Avnish Bajaj was the head of Bazi and Bazi was selling pornographic content, the court declared that Avnish Bajaj needs to be arrested for this. Um, in the aftermath of that, uh, India incorporated these rules of intermediary safe harbor. Uh, which is kind of a, almost now a global rule, uh, which came up through international deliberations and, and has been there for a long time in um, US and European law as well, which basically says that platforms which essentially allow two people to connect to each other um, are simply intermediaries. And as intermediaries, uh, you know, they don't need to be, they, they should not be liable for the kind of speeches or the kind of connections that people are making with each other. So Facebook, as a platform, as an intermediary, is only facilitating communication between two people, and therefore, as an intermediary, should not legally be liable. And this is an important rule, right? Because if you think about it, um, even though Facebook is moderating content and has responsibility over content of some sort, it is not the person generating or creating that content. So the forms of liability definitely differ. And this came up in a context where, in the absence of intermediary safe harbor protections, um, you know online platforms could very easily be bullied into censorship by anybody, by governments particularly, or by anybody with a high social standing saying that I'm going to sue you if you don't take these rules down. So this kind of helped um, maintain a modicum of protection, innovation, and um, you know, free speech online. Um, ultimately, this, this question of the limits of safe harbor online went to the Supreme Court um, in the Shia single decision, which you might know um, where the Supreme Court has struck down Section 66A of the IT Act. In that, um, the Supreme Court modified the language of Section 79 to make it even more difficult um, for anybody to interfere in or, or to hold platforms liable for the kind of speech that they've been hosting. So in Shia Single versus UAY, um, just reading out the portion, they said that platforms have to receive actual, have to have actual knowledge of the unlawful content and then fail to do anything about it in order for them to even think about being liable for that content in the end. Right. So if I say something, um, if I have say something hateful on um, Facebook, they will only be liable if uh, the person who is affected can manage to get a government order or a court degree, which says that this is unlawful content and Facebook must take it down. In theory, this is a great rule. Uh, it means that it's a deliberation that's made at least um, with some modicum of kind of judicial oversight or with some independent oversight. Um, Unfortunately, what it's resulted in is, you know, practic being, being practically unworkable um, because you cannot expect millions of people who have grouses about uh, being attacked online, particularly vulnerable minorities and marginalized communities uh, to start going to courts or start going to the government. Um, you know, Kashmiris or, uh, you know, queer people are not going to start approaching courts uh, because they've been censored by Facebook. So. Um, or, or rather because they've been attacked on Facebook and want, want that speech censored or, or want to be protected. Um, so this is kind of um, what, you know, what the status quo is. Um, there are also certain kinds of guidelines that need to be followed under the law. They're very vague guidelines. They don't really say much about what a platform should or should not do. Um, and, but recently the government in 2018 has tried to change those um, intermediary guidelines. So under the law, um, and the thing that I most particularly want to point out is that they want every platform to uh, adopt automated filters to proactively identify unlawful speech. Now, this is incredibly vague uh, phrasing, right? They basically, um, you know, 
what constitutes unlawful information or content um, and how our platforms are expected to make this decision has not been given under these guidelines, which basically means that any and all um, you know, responsibility for flagging unlawful speech goes to the platform. Um, a platform which, if it does not flag unlawful speech, can potentially be persecuted and fined crores of rupees. Um, what that essentially means is that it's definitely going to lead to overblocking, definitely going to lead to a system of overfiltration of lawful content, uh, which is very, very scary. Um, the other thing that th this has led to the Shreya Single Standard and the absence of kind of agency or um, you know legal oversight about content moderation is that there's supreme, that you know various courts have stepped in and established their own models of how content moderation should work, um, which is kind of antithetical to both Shreya Single as well as um, Section 79 of the IT Act. Um, so in Sabu Matthew George, the Supreme Court came up with the doctrine of auto block, saying that Google must auto block any ad which um, is contrary to prenatal sex determination laws. Um, similarly, in Reprajwala, again in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said that um, you know, there needs to be a committee um, which will uh, you know, comprise a, a bunch of independent people as well as platforms, and they will decide rules of automate, automatically taking down violence against women and sexual imagery, um, which violent, yeah, like violent sexual imagery against women. Similarly, there's been a lot of executive arbitrariness in, in how these rules are applied. So when the Indian elections were going on last year um, and the problems of fake news and hate speech were proliferating, the election commission of India tied up with Facebook and Google and then issued them executive orders. We still don't know how those orders were come up with. We don't know what these rules were that the ECI was complying with. We simply have to go with uh, you know, the news reports or, or, or kind of the ECI's word that it was acting in good faith and it was being transparent. So how do we finally go about um, solving this? You know, what, what is the way out of this quagmire? Um, like I said, I don't think you know, the issue is, um, or at least at least the point of this talk is not to kind of give an active solution about uh, you know, how do we solve privatized censorship by platforms and how do we make social media better, but to kind of recognize that these are the problems and these are the focus areas in which things can be improved. Right? So if the problem is currently the fact that you're, you're swinging between government censorship and platform private censorship, is there a middle ground and can we improve something in, in that respect? And I think there's a lot to be improved before we start considering things like automated, you know, robo filters, uh, like the Indian government has been doing. And the way forward to this is to increase user agency or not, you know, not, not users, but increase the agency of the communities and individuals participating in online speech. Um, and how do you do that? You make your rules more transparent to people. Uh, you make yourself more accountable to people, right? Um, so you release information to the public you, um, or to researchers or to affected people about how you're doing, engaging in these content moderation practices and give justifications for why you're uh, engaging in these content moderation practices. Um, you have accountability, uh, which means that if I have a problem with how Facebook has censored my speech or Twitter has censored my speech, um, I can approach somebody, a person ideally, who can you know, assess the evidence and then overturn a wrong decision and apply a clear standard of rules. Um, these are not, you know, they seem like small asks, but translating them again into the question of scale and into the question of very, very different contexts is difficult. Um, and of course, there are limits of self-regulation. Now, uh, different platforms are trying, you know, different ways of self-regulating themselves. Um, one major effort has been the recent Facebook oversight board, where they've basically created a Supreme Court um, through which certain cases of online content moderation uh, will be filtered up to a committee of 40 individuals who will deliberate amongst themselves and come up with, you know, almost a constitutional uh, rule for Facebook to follow throughout all of its practices. Whether this will work, you know, again, uh, taking into account all of the various contexts in which Facebook operates um, and the scale at which it operates, it remains to be seen. And whether it, you know, when it, what happens when it conflicts with Facebook's business logic, all of these are uh, left to be seen. Um, but what I want to talk about or what I want to endorse more is kind of, you know, taking more democratic control of the online public sphere, ideally through laws, um, which doesn't necessarily mean that we give the government more power. I think there are tactical and strategic ways for communities to engage with, um, you know, um, to engage with online platforms, to come up with rules that benefit them um, and which empower them. Uh, but yeah, ideally, all of this should be um, you know, done through the rule of law. It should, it should be parliamentary. It should be, um, have the uh, intervention of the judiciary as well. 
And there are some um, laws and some jurisdictions that are already thinking about this. Um, I think, you know, uh, the Network Enforcement Act in Germany, which was initially kind of chided for being overly, cens- uh, you know, overly censored, has actually turned out to be, um, t- turned out to draw a different kind of balance. Uh, whether you think that that's a better balance depends on what your views about online safety and online censorship are. It's le- led to an increase in censorship, but um, possibly also an increase in kind of, uh, you know, the persecution of online minorities or marginalized communities. Um, and led to a decrease in hate speech. So that's a balance that I think, you know, whatever, wherever the line we draw it, it should be a balance that's drawn democratically and uh, through kind of participatory mechanisms. Yeah. And finally, I just want to give some resources um, and also, you know, talk about the question about why Mastodon didn't end up replacing Twitter. Um, so the resources, I think some of these are, um, some of these are work that, that has been done by uh, co-fellows at the Mozilla Foundation with me. Um, and they've done some fantastic work tracking online content moderation, um, responding to it and, you know, giving tools for people to kind of participate in it. Um, Silenced Online is a repository of how, uh, you know, content moderation has gone bad. Uh, the um, Heroku app is, um, uh, Science Online is made by um, Leil Zara. Um, Heroku by... Um, Emmy, who is a, another fellow who has basically given tools to understand how hate speech has been proliferating and kind of track it and respond to it. Um, ranking digital rights and Santa Clara principles are two important kind of um, self-regulatory works which do a little bit of name and shaming and advocacy around how platforms can improve. And finally, um, you know, uh, this is a, the last link is an interesting link about um, how uh, decentralized social networks can work, right? And the problem, of course, which I wanted to point out is that when everybody left to ma- left um, Twitter to join Mastodon, um, what they didn't realize that is that, you know, um, the problem of platform censorship is a problem that's not simply a technical problem. Um, it's a problem that is a problem of, um, you know, it's a social problem. Um, it's a problem about how you form communities and how you think about online communities. And Twitter is a, um, is a way in which, you know, um, it's come across as a, a, a community at scale where we've prioritized a massive scale over kind of interpersonal relations or smaller networks. Um, so perhaps Mastodon can replace uh, Twitter to the extent that it can allow you to connect to your smaller networks and create different kinds of communities. Um, but it will never replace Twitter in doing what Twitter does. Right? So um, yeah, to basically say that, you know, uh, people kind of didn't realize that once you move away from a, one kind of community, you need to build and sustain a different kind of community um, on Mastodon or on your decentralized network. So perhaps the problem is not simply technological, but it's about uh, what kind of values we want to create and thinking more deeply about these as we set about uh, to create new platforms. And yeah, I think I've gone fairly about time, but I'll hand it over to Paul now. Okay, cool. Um... So far, we have not gotten any questions on YouTube or on Zoom yet. So I'm going to start the ball rolling over here. Um, uh, speaking of Mastodon, because you ended kind of, uh, kind of over there, um, Mastodon had this uh, weird moment when it started gaining traction, um, where uh, some of the uh, American servers started noticing problems in the servers in Japan as uh, engaging in content that was obscene, um, uh, pornographic, uh, according to their social or cultural interpretation. Um, and the way Mastodon server worked uh, for this particular group, uh, it's the same way that Discord servers kind of set their own rules. Uh, Mastodon servers uh, also end up setting their own rules. Uh, and what was interesting was uh, uh, they asked them to kind of mind their own business because it was their own social petty dish. So their rules kind of work. Uh, and I don't think a lot of people understood uh, how the dynamics kind of work because this was uh, kind of new in the way it was playing out. So when you had mentioned uh, how Facebook has a centralized or a universal like code of ethics in terms of moderating content, mm-hmm. uh, how do you see this kind of playing out? Because the question that I was kind of arriving to was, you have moderation principles that are 
there as a result of the way digital platforms exist. Uh, do you see bleed throughs happening in physical spaces in terms of speech? Uh, in terms of sensitivity, uh, people asking to be censored and things like that. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I can't think of any explicit examples about how that may be happening. Uh, but one thing that, you know, comes to mind is kind of um, how certain kinds of institutional or legal logics have been exported through platforms, right? Mm -hmm. um, because when we think about, you know, the kind of social or legal rules that we follow regarding speech, um, you know, we have, for example, India has very fairly strong protections against hate speech. Right. Um, but the concept of hate speech more or less like doesn't exist under First Amendment US law. Um, <clears> you know, they don't like it's, it's fairly difficult to think about hate speech under US law. And Jeremy Walton has kind of made a very strong case about, um, you know, why US law should recognize and counter hate speech. Um, something that to a large extent, Indian, the Indian Constitution and courts have recognized. Right? <laughs> but the platforms are largely operating within this First Amendment um, sphere at least before governments started jumping in and trying to regulate platforms as they have now, okay. um, they kind of, uh, you know, operating as they did within the U S um, you know, mostly American legal logic, they started exporting those rules, which is why I think a lot of the design choices that they made a lot mm -hmm. of the kind of, you know, um, Twitter's initial, uh, you know, push towards exporting democracy in, in, in Arab spring or even, um, you know, uh, Facebook's like, we promote connections and we promote hate speech. Um, I think that the moment they started realizing that these are like important concerns um, are when they started having offices or kind of having, uh, you know, um, taking into account what their users or what their communities in the rest of the world thought about this. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think, I don't know if that answered your question, but I definitely think that kind of it, it changed the, you know, the logics of how communities, um, think about speech all around the world by exporting those logics from uh, one legal or institutional framework onto another. Right. Uh, Reggie from Zoom has uh, an interesting question. Are there any online platforms that deal with complaint redressal for online disputes? Um, now, most of the large online platforms already have their complaint redressal mechanisms. Uh, they don't work very well granted. Um, so it is, again, like I said, I don't think there's um, one platform which necessarily streamlines all of this. There are some platforms that you can use to kind of, as a researcher or as an affected individual, get more information. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the Lumen database is a great one for this because uh, it keeps track of takedown requests from across the world. Okay. Um, it's a database that was initially created by Google and then uh, now is hosted at Harvard University. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, at least Twitter and Facebook, um, and Reddit kind of have, uh, you know, at least they, they'll give you the option of, uh, reporting any grievances to some kind of mechanism. Uh, the problem of course, is that you don't know how long it's going to take to respond. You don't know how the, what the rules are that are being applied, nor do you know how those rules are being applied. Um, which is why, you know, I often get really absurd things. Like I have a habit of going on Twitter and, you know, tagging right wing, like hate speech. And then Facebook, uh, you know, Twitter comes back to me and says, uh, yes, uh, this is hate speech. It violates our community guidelines. Um, but when I check that speech is still online, so I don't know what action has been taken against them. Yeah. I, I was just going to kind of, uh, uh, pin a question from Reggie's question. So, uh, uh, it, it's, an interesting question in terms of the paucity of time. So a lot of people don't either have the time or the wherewithal to kind of interpret EULA or uh, an existing uh, moderation uh, kind of document or a playbook that uh, is generally available on each of these digital platforms. Uh, and Reggie kind of follows it up by asking, do we need one? because then it would kind of act as this point where you go to, as opposed to when you're either blocked or deplatformed, uh, you generally seek recourse to someone who knows this, uh, but they're not doing it full time. Um, and this kind of puts people into a dilemma. Do you think, uh, or do you know of examples uh, where people have tried to create something like that? 
again so i think the problem is one of uh, legal accountability mm-hmm. right um it's not like platforms don't know that they're doing this it's that they're kind of deliberately not doing it because they don't have to and because they consider themselves as like these private fiefdoms um which operate purely in the private realm of contract law um and don't need to be accountable to people right so i think so if you go back to for example the kind of structures that the net dg has created um the german law mm-hmm. um it has created you know it has made the incentive mechanisms for um uh you know all of these platforms to be more accountable to have grievance redress and mechanisms established in the law and to have clear timelines for responding to these mechanisms right yeah. um and i think that's kind of what works ultimately you need governments to tell the tell platforms like you need to comply with the law um because simply relying upon their commercial logics doesn't seem to be working and and i don't see you know how you can persuade them unless there's a similar kind of mass exodus and because of the very unique kind of logic of platform arms um, and how they operate mm-hmm. it's kind of difficult to envisage like a mass exodus without systematic change or like the law interfering and breaking up big platforms right so it's a it, it's a loop question like i i don't see um yeah i i think that regulatory intervention is almost definitely necessary and perhaps like a simple you know like a technical or a business um intervention may not be enough are you trying to say that um but so this is what is kind of uh, confusing so uh, if there is a chilling effect on a platform it would make logical and business uh, sense to kind of prevent that chilling effect by uh, kind of addressing it uh are you saying that there has not been a uh, a case of a chilling effect around something like censorship or hate speech or fake news uh, or aggressive or weak moderation for people to kind of uh, act in on this in a timely way uh, have there been modifications in the way these platforms work yeah so there have and like i mentioned you know um there have of course been lots of complaints about how this has happened there's been lots of advocacy around uh you know the kind of arbitrariness that platforms have been engaged in mm-hmm. right so which is why like go back to the equality labs report that i pointed out to or go back to these initiatives on this slide um and companies have responded to that in their own manner mm-hmm. so you know um facebook's oversight board is almost like a you know a reconstitutionalization of how facebook's uh speech practices um operate right like they're trying to make it so that it works under a framework of similar to the rule of law but like a private framework that way um but they still haven't kind of given you know clear instances of what one affected user can do um so this is about coming up with principles for how of how facebook can work right but it's not um a regulation in terms of you know if i have a if i submit a complaint to facebook it will come back to me in 24 hours and say mm-hmm. what it has done to address that complaint that doesn't exist anywhere you can right. hold the platform accountable in case there's no action be taken exactly so uh, there, there, there's no law which can kind of prevent a platform from censoring right, right. Sim- like a government for example um is constitutionally prohibited from censoring me in many circumstances you would right. call it a restriction on your uh, freedom of speech right. um but that freedom of speech doesn't necessarily translate onto private platforms simply because they have pushed themselves as private platforms and i think a reconceptualization is therefore necessary to think about them as public utilities or start thinking about them as regulatable regulatable entities right not right. necessarily ones that should be liable for content but ones that should be accountable for how that content is moderated by them right uh devika on youtube has asked um uh my question is that given the shreya singhal case law how do you justify suomoto removal of information by facebook which violates its community guidelines or when a user reports some content yeah um like s- same question <laughs> somewhat and thanks for that question but yeah it's basically that's the problem right um you can to a large degree see, see there are a few ways of doing this and um in the us for example uh, people have tried to sue facebook or our social media platforms for wrongly taking down or wrongly censoring censoring them um but you know go back and read the terms of use um you may you as a user um or as an individual or a community have to follow facebook's community guideline 
Facebook, on the other hand, does not have to follow anything. It's not accountable to you in any manner. It's ultimately only accountable to its shareholders. Right. right. Um, and this is a problem that, of course, we've also faced in the privacy discourse, where right. we talked about, you know, what is the responsibility that platforms have. Um, um, and then there's been this reconceptualization of platforms as fiduciaries, as right. uh, holding duties of care. And in fact, um, you know, this duty of care approach, which is kind of a very old approach um, for the industrial era in, under tort law, um, has kind has been mooted already. Um, mm. So the the UK in its online harms white paper has thought about this duty of adopting a duty of care approach, which is a more common law, uh, you know, legal approach towards uh, defining how platforms work. But it's then it it swings the other way. The duty of care because it's not. Uh, set out as clear standards or principles to follow, can be vaguely interpreted. Yeah, then it leads to chill, uh, the chilling effect. So again, you know, it's about that. It's a, it's about where you want to draw, draw that boundary. It's about kind of, you know, thinking. Start to think about those laws and start to think about where you want to draw those boundaries. Right. But yeah, to answer the basic question, um, you can try to sue them if you can make a creative interpretation of contract law. Uh, but I don't think it will work. Um, uh, this. Uh, this uh, part of the presentation where you were talking about um, uh, how uh, the platforms kind of interpret themselves, there's one aspect how they sell themselves to potential first-time users. So um, uh, Facebook initially starts out as a social networking platform. Uh, a lot of the content is still mundane content. Um, but you do have... Uh, another role that both Facebook, Twitter, and now other platforms as well, when push comes to shove, they become uh, sites that host news. Uh, and I think there have been many instances where uh, these platforms, uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter function more or less like open platforms, WhatsApp kind of functions like a closed one. Uh, each of them have their own uh, kind of agency in terms of allowing news to disseminate. Uh, but when it comes to hate speech or fake news, uh, and as uh, in the presentation you described, uh, they were trying to hold, uh, each of those governments were trying to hold WhatsApp uh, complicit in its role of spreading fake news. Yeah. Um, they kind of uh, step back from uh, being disseminators of news. They say that we are a social networking platform. Um, this is uh, this is an interesting manifestation of what you just uh, described, where they you can't hold them accountable in the way you hold individuals. So, do you see this? Um, I think you described it as the intermediary law. Um, do you see another way of interpreting this? Because they seem to be making use of this loophole. That they can both function as an individual with individual laws, but not be held accountable as being an individual uh, or being held as a platform or a space law. Like the metaphors seem really like all over the place. Yeah, and, and it's entirely deliberate. Um, so the, the choice of framing themselves as platforms or as intermediaries while mm -hmm. continuing to, you know, um, you know, deploy like or, or uh, kind of have power over the network and modify the network or recommend stuff um, is a choice that platforms make. And it's sometimes it leads them into, you know, more difficult territory, but mostly it's uh, done to their benefit. So they're allowed to modify the law to their benefit. And because most laws only have this very blanket charter saying that if you're an intermediary, which means that, you know, if you're not yourself generating the content. Um, and I mean, in India, technically the, uh, law uses the term modify, but that term has not been expanded upon. So okay. it's possible for a lawyer to go to court and say that Facebook is modifying content when it shares news with me. <laughs> um, but I don't know if it would work. But right. yeah, I, definitely, um, you know, there's a great article uh, called The Politics of Platforms, uh, written by Dalton Gillespie, which kind of unpacks this. Right? It unpacks the kind of duplicity that's involved in framing something as a platform uh, while actually being you know, the core, like logic that's responsible for governing speech, right. um, you know, platform seems like, you know, it's raising me up to a certain level so that people can see me right. as an individual, as a community, whatever, what it doesn't say is that, you know, it's the platform is also kind of like shaking you around, moving you, turning you upside down. Um, right. So, 
Uh, another question was um, around the human labor bit, um, and uh, this was kind of uh, edging towards what is happening now. So, uh, on one side, you have uh, an algorithmic way of moderating um, content, uh, and we see this as you described around takedowns of content that might be violating or being perceived as a violation of. Uh, uh, IP, uh, but on the other hand, when you're trying to block either hate speech or obscene content um, in in uh, this specific time period during a pandemic, uh, the kind of prompts that come back is that uh, we are pressed uh, in terms of the workforce behind this, uh, and uh, not sure how it's kind of playing out. So. In terms of IP uh, protection, there seems to be algorithmic moderation. But in terms of hate speech uh, content, uh, there seems to be human uh, labor involved. Uh, is there any particular reason why it's been played out this way and why it's not more proportionate? Um, so yeah, there's a few reasons. And just to give some context, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, uh, to kind of make this more COVID relevant, I guess, uh, what you've seen um, since the beginning of the pandemic is that companies, social media companies have laid off, uh, you know, or rather stopped work for content moderators, uh, which has made, made them rely more heavily on automated content. And now you have even more complaints coming out, both from the IP side, as well as general kind of speech government content, because automated content is being used in other areas as well. Um, and it kind of depends yeah, so I mean, you have to go back a little bit to the kind of technology that's at the heart of this, right? Um, most of it is fingerprinting technology, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is a very simple kind of direct matching technology, right? So it'll match like something, uh, uh, um, a bit of text or a bit of image that has already been uploaded to a server and has been determined to be illegal, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, this works well for, say, a video or a piece of cultural content which has been copyrighted because those are by definition, unique, right? Um, cultural, like copyrighted content has to be a creative and unique piece of work. Okay. So it's easy to kind of match that. Um, it's easy to fingerprint and then create a database of that and match that. Okay. Even though it's not, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily correct to do so. Because okay. like I said, the context, um, you know, even in IP it depends on how you're using a particular kind of image or work. Um, but it is technically much more possible. On the other hand, hate speech, um, you know, it's, and there's a fascinating paper, in fact, about somebody who tried to create a machine learning model uh, mm -hmm. to determine racial hate speech. Mm -hmm. um, now, what ended up happening was that, uh, you know, African American communities and other communities use racial language in very different ways, right? Um, and it's very important, like, you know, it's very important for those communities to use that language. Um, but the machine learning model, what it ended up doing was that it took the speech um, that it determined was hateful according to one standard and applied yeah. it to the other standard. It, it applied it to how Americans yeah. were using, you know, kind of racialized speech. Um, and that's where context becomes really important, right? You need to know how people are communicating with, with, with each other and, um, you know, what is the community, um, what are kind of like the expectations within the community in which people are speaking to each other. Right. So, which is why um, if you're not using a fingerprinting technique, which is not context dependent and one way, one, one way in which this, you know, this has worked fantastically well, um, or at least as you know, there have, there have been systems created around um, um, the use or the takedown of child sexual abuse imagery. And, well, it's not worked fantastically well, but at least like, you know, it's, it has resulted in a lot of um, takedowns of child sexual abuse imagery. Um, and that's because we all universally almost ag agree that like this content is harmful and is bad, right? right? There are no disagreements. There is no context specificity about it. Um, you know, if you, if you're uploading an image, which has been used in this context, there's no other justification for it. On right. the other hand, even in something as, you know, if you take extremist content, for example, it could be used uh, in the context of news reportage. It mm -hmm. could be used in the context of, um, a parody, it could be used for war reporting. And all of these are really important, um, you know, public functions. Right. So, um, you know, whether you're using an ISIS video to make a critical commentary about ISIS or whether you're using it to spread 
extremist speech is not very clear um, right. so even when something like that gets fingerprinted and you know um is matched using that fingerprinting technique it becomes incredibly difficult to uh you know kind of input that context and make the correct decision but in terms of uh, content takedown um uh, especially if like you said cute cat videos with uh, audio content uh, they they are not particularly looking at context there it's only just fingerprint matching that they take them down it's very weird how uh, unevenly uh, context kind of plays out in terms of uh, looking at content um uh, i have one more uh, question i don't think there is any new questions on either of the sides um uh, and it's kind of uh, playing off the earlier one um uh, in china in terms of moderation and censorship they have certain interesting ways of keyword filtering um Uh, and they use human labor to a much much greater extent um to kind of make sure that uh, dissent is served in uh, different ways and uh, to kind of play along the game of escalation of cat and mouse um you have different people trying to subvert keyword filters and they often use this using cultural markers like children's rhymes and like that so uh, the grass mud horse is uh, an interesting example of a uh, kind of trying to evade both uh, machine filtering and human filtering because it's difficult to understand how um whether the thing is being said in jest because in mandarin it's based on the inflection of the language do you think that we'll reach that kind of a point because it seems like um uh, all it requires is uh, a law in place for things to kind of start moving ahead do you see opposition for that kind of tangent um that's really interesting i would prefer if uh, we didn't go down that path and yeah I, i really like i think it's really interesting the kind of the you know the vinnie the pooh example for uh, how yes. chinese citizens <laughs> refer to uh, xi jinping um right. i mean yeah ultimately that that's the thing right it's is the wicked problem can also use uh, work in favor of users um or in favor of community um i don't i don't know like i mean i i uh do you see these conversations since um the uh, uh data protection uh, bill started coming into like public discourse um people kind of being worried that these kind of uh, bills would become acts and then it would be part of uh, legal framework so the way platform and conversation of platform would work um yeah definitely i think there's been a lot of pushback against the intermediary guidelines rules as well a lot of advocacy about pushing back particularly like against the automated uh, uh take down stuff um and i think yeah i mean a- another thing that ties into kind of your question is um also one of the justifications that platforms and governments give for not making the rules of engagement very clear right uh, so they say that if we re- release rules which say that you know a uh, free kashmir is seditious um, right. and people will find ways to game it right right um and this is a common kind of something that's like often talked about in terms of algorithmic um explainability or trans- transparency um right. where people are scared of gamification of the specific uh you know very specific rules that are applied on online pl- platforms and they're not sure um how they can then start to counter that right so, uh reji is kind of Uh, added into that conversation by saying that we have loads of languages unlike china with mandarin and cantonese it will be a nightmare yeah absolutely i mean the languages by themselves are a nightmare for uh, nlp to kind of make sense of but when you add a layer of culture with the way the language is used it makes it even more difficult yeah. uh, to kind of moderate and then you have different manifestations of all of these conversations cool i think we are almost at the end of time and i don't see any more questions oops okay cool. uh do you want to uh, conclude this like um no i mean i already concluded in my presentation per se but uh, yeah i definitely hope that uh, you know people kind of see this and are able to understand more about um what action they can take in terms of you know responding to policy initiatives by the government 
um, and kind of participating more actively in or understanding more actively how platforms are shaping online lives. Okay, thank you, Devij. Awesome. Um, uh, thank you, Reggie and uh, Devika for asking a question. Devika for asking a question. Sorry, uh, and all the other participants who logged on. So, thank you. Uh, signing off.